Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone who are watching online. Well, and also in, in this room. And my name is Sikilin Yu Pong, and I would like to welcome you guys to the uh, Eve Colloquium number 18. Okay. For this talk, we have a distinguished guest speaker, a Professor Chin Ji Sutikawa from Department of Physics, Waseda um, University, Japan. So he's going to give a talk on the topic uh, in spiral gravitational waves from compact battery system in Hordinsky gravity. Let's join me, welcome to speak. Okay, thanks for the nice introduction. Okay, and uh, thanks for having an um, opportunity to have a talk here. Okay, yes. So, yeah, I'm Shin Tsujikawa from Waseda University in Tokyo. Actually, uh, that stayed in Japan for six months. And, <laughs> and also, yeah, he, yeah, Peter also recently came. Yes. And actually, we work together. Yes. Right. Yes. And so, okay, so today I talk on something like creative gravitational waves. So, title is like this Inspire Gravitational Wave from Compact Binary System in Hondensky Gravity. Okay. Yeah, this is a work with my student. So Yurika Yoshino, and also some people in Tokyo and Tokyo. So, so basically, I at maybe first maybe twenty minutes or so, I talk on something basic, so the enter some technical detail. Maybe I shouldn't enter too much technical detail, but anyway, so I talk on something about that. So, wait, okay. So this was originally predicted by Einstein. So Einstein's theory of relativity predicts that a transverse waves, which are called gravitational waves, yes. And so this is a wave okay. the proportional to t minute, and this is actually constant, and she is the speed of light, and g is, and left-hand side is called Einstein's the geometric quantity, so whole kind of given, okay, curved background, so you can diminish. Okay, so this is a kind of describing some curvature of the space time. And T minute is some tensor, so this is, an, if you have some kind of matter, you have some energy and momentum, and we call some energy momentum tensor. Einstein relates to his to geometric G minu and T minu in this way. So this is called Einstein equation. And then uh, the difference of Newton gravity is that this actually equation, so general relativity actually includes this tensor quantity, G minu, the geometric tensor. And this quantity contains a tensor wave, actually I, I denote like theta minu. And so unlike Newton gravity, so this, actually tensor quantity actually propagates, okay? And that's called gravitational waves. For example, if you write some, okay, this equation on the Minkowski background, okay? Then uh, you can show that the spatial component of theta mu nu obeys this kind of simple equation. There are some issue of gauges, etc. but I just want to <laughs> that schematically write some, okay, form of the equation. So usually it takes off this whole. So this is a form of a wave equation. So now you can see that this contains some second time derivative, and this is a spatial derivative. And here you find C. So yeah, so if you hand side, this is a wave equation motion. Now, so you have some source term, some energy momentum tensor on the right hand side, and this like a source term for C to J. And, okay, actually with the speed of light C. So you can see that here, you can see the C and C is a C. So it means that gravitational wave propagates with the speed of light. Yes. That's a general relativity predict. Yes. So if you consider some different theories, it, 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 this is not the general case. So propagation speed can be different from the speed of light, but the general relativity predicts that okay, propagation speed is equivalent to the speed of light. Yeah, that's a prediction. And okay, so so if you they try to detect gravitational waves, so we need some kind of sources which have some kind of okay, strong, a large energy momentum tensor, okay, like a compact binary system like black hole or neutral star binaries. 
And in that case, just the TIJ, right hand side, become very large. And in that case, it works like a source term for gravitational wave CTIJ. And, and then in that case, gravitational wave with large amplitude, okay, can be emitted. Okay. So we have to find out those kind of sources which have very large energy momentum tensor. That's a case of like a black hole, black hole binary or a black hole neutron star binary or neutron star neutron star binary system. So yeah, there are sources of the gravitational waves. So the first one is really detected in 2015, okay, just after the okay, uh, construction of the general relativity after 100 years of the construction of the relativity, the gravitational wave was found. The first detection was black hole, black hole binary system. And actually after two years, in 2017, the interesting phenomenon was actually found, some neutral star, neutral star binary was actually found. Okay. This also gave us kind of new information okay, for the propagation of gravity that I talk later. And also recently, like a couple of years ago, so we found like black hole neutron star binary system and we actually detected gravitational waves so from, you know, from this kind of source, yes. That's what I talk later, okay. Yeah, so, right. So the first detection was really black hole, black hole binary, okay. So this kind of sketch of the detected by LIGO, it's called GW, okay, 15094.14. And this is a coalescence of black hole a billion years ago, okay? And so the mass, masses of black hole is like 36, 29 solar mass. And then if you sum up this mass, it's 65 solar mass. And after the coalescence, we have some new black hole whose mass is solar mass. And the last three solar mass is actually carried oh, away yeah. by gravitational waves. Us. So the phenomenon of 1.3 billion years ago actually reached us okay, through gravitational waves. And, and the amplitude actually has in inversely proportional to the distance. So it is non trivial to detect gravitational waves. For example, initially around the amplitude of gravitational waves is large, or as close as over the one, but the distance is so, so large. I mean, 1.3 billion years ago. Kind of okay, the amplitude okay, as it travels to the Earth. So typically, the amplitude is of order like 10 to minus 21. It's very small. So it's really non trivial to detect the ocean wave. But LIGO actually improves some quality of the instrument. And, they, yes. and this is a detection of the GW150914 event by LIGO. Actually, two detectors at Livingstone and Hanford, which is like 3,000 kilometers away, I think. And these are the gravitational waveform at, at Livingstone, left one, and right one is Hanford. Okay, and they, if they try to overlap each other, so it shows good agreement. I mean, two data show good agreement with each, with each other. Yes, yes. And this is the first detection gravitational wave. And actually, from the gravitational waveform, we can learn actually many things. For example, so yeah, so this is a kind of we call in spiral. So just before the coalescence, we call in spiral phase of the gravitational waves, and it actually approaches in this way, and merging, and then after the merging, single kind of object. Yes. So this is a typical kind of coalescence of black hole or neutron stars. And by measuring this amplitude, so you can see that this is really small, like 10 to minus 21, okay? And by measuring this amplitude, so we know the distance to the object. So the first detection case, it's like 1.3 billion years ago. And this is the first information, the distance is known. And also, if you measure this waveform, okay, during inspired haze, I mean, from the frequency and changes of the waveform, during the inspire phase. Actually, you can see that the frequency gradually increases, yes. And, and then by, yes, by using those kind of information then, it, actually we can determine the masses and spins of compact objects, yes, 
example, so these masses and spin is actually known from, by measuring this kind of reaction wave. So it, it gives some very important information. It contains those kind of information. And also from the waveform after the coalescence, the mass and spin of single body. So after the coalescence, it becomes single body, and we can actually measure the mass and spin. Yeah, in the current observation, so it, this kind of ring down phase is not really very measured. So actually, so we don't have kind of good information after the coalescence, but uh, during the spiral phase, so we have some observed version waveform, so we can put some constraint on the mass is spin and also other kind of possible modification of gravity. That's what I talk later. And, okay, so for example, so, so this is like observed frequency of gradual waves, okay? So if you, okay, basically it comes from just the kind of rotation of the binaries. Basically the compact binary like black hole, black hole, or neutron star, neutron star binaries during the inspired phase rotate about uh, 10 to 1,000 times per second. It's very, very fast kind of movement. And then and, and it actually generates the gravitational wave frequency. So the frequency of gravitational waves is typically between 10 and 1,000 hertz, yes. And for example, so if you have a look at figure here, for example, see here. So 0 0.35 second and 0 0.4 second, it's like 0 0.05 second. So it actually oscillates right here, 2.5 times. So then you can compute frequency, 2.5 divided by 0 0.05 second. Then around here, it's, it, you can say that it's like 50 hertz, right? Yes. So, and then you can see that this is actually increasing. So initially, so the frequency is actually smaller than 50 hertz, but gradually increasing, okay. This actually happened because of the gravitational radiation, which I talk later. Yes, so, yeah. So actually we have theory, so general relativity. So, and then we can compute how the gravitational wave changes. And then, so we can actually compare the theory with observation. Or some modification of gravity. So if you modify kind of gravity, so this gravitational waveform is actually modified. So then we can see some signature for the modification of gravity. So, right. And actually, so 2070, there, we, we also found some event like neutron star, neutron binary, okay, event. And so then, as I said already, so during the, from the information during the inspired phase, so we can put some constraint on the mass of, on the spin of the neutron stars. So in this case, so LIGO as a put constraint on the masses of two neutron stars. So here is a constraint. So the red one is a lighter mass and blue one is a heavier mass. And they put some constraint in this range. Okay, this is the two masses of the neutron stars. Okay. So, and, and then, so also we have some constraint for the radius. Then, so actually, by measuring this kind of mass and radius of neutron star, so we can pick up some information for the structure of the neutron star. So there are many uncertainty for the equation of state of neutron stars, and each equation of state gives some, some different massive mass and also radius. And then we can compare those kind of prediction with gravitational wave observation. So then, yeah, some of the actually neutron star equation of state are actually ruled out okay, from this kind of gravitational wave measurement. So it gives some new information for the nuclear physics in the very and the dense object. Yes. Yes. So yeah, it now so it's not, not possible to prove the physics of neutron star as well as black hole through gravitational wave observation. That's the message. So actually, uh, regarding this neutron star neutron star coalescence event, so it also gives some uh, important information. So actually, with gravitational waves, the gamma ray also came, okay? And a gamma ray was also detected, okay? So this is a kind of gravity wave detection, and gamma ray also came. And that's also almost at the same time. So, and gamma ray, 
the speed is actually the speed of light, right? The gamma ray is, yeah, has a speed of light. And, and gravitational waves actually arrive almost at the same time as gamma ray. So it means that the speed of actually gravitational waves is really similar to the speed of light. And then LIGO put some constant. Yes, because gamma ray arrive at Earth almost at the same time as a gravitational wave emitted from the neutron stand neutron binary. Okay, fine. Okay. And this is a constant. Okay, this is the speed of gravity divided by C. Okay. And deviation from one is really small. So it's smaller than of order like 10 to minus 15. Okay. It means that speed of gravity is almost identical okay, to the speed of light. And zero relativity predicts that CG is equivalent to C. So this band on CG is actually consistent with the prediction of general relativity, yes. So if you actually modify gravity, this CG can deviate from C, then those kind of theories can be ruled out. So yeah, so now, so we can use this kind of constant, okay, for the construction of some viable, okay, model of some modified gravity, for example. So anyway, so it gives a lot of information. Right. Okay, so this is kind of, up to now, it's kind of introduction. But now, so I want to talk on something more kind of technical issue. So testing gravitational theories in strong gravity regime. So we know that GR is consistent with solar system experiment and sublimiter laboratory test. It will test it in but, but still, we are not sure the accuracy of GR in strong gravity regimes, like the vicinity of black hole and neutron stars. So I want to test gravity and possible deviation from general relativity through the gravitational wave measurement. Yes, so that's what I want to do. Yes, and, and actually, so there are also some other kind of motivation to do this kind of stuff. But from the cosmological side, there are some long-standing problems, such as the origin of dark, dark energy and dark matter. So, like Planck and satellite can put some constraint okay, for the energy budget in the today's universe. So then dark energy is like 68% and dark matter is 27%. So 95% of the present universe, the energy density of the universe is unknown, okay? I mean, only 5% is, uh, we know, like barium. So we don't know the origin of them, so, okay? So it may come from something, okay? Something beyond general relativity or standard model particle physics. So there may be some new degree of freedom, okay? Which may be, which may cause this kind of phenomenon like dark energy, dark matter. And to address this problem of dark energy and dark matter, for example, so people typically introduce additional degree of freedom Okay, like scalar field or kind of vector field. Okay, so this kind of field can play some role for dark energy and dark matter. And if, if this is the case, so it can play some role okay, in the strong gravity regime like black hole or neutron stars. That's also a motivation. Yes. Right. So, okay, so for example, I want to talk on something simple. <laughs> I think the simplest kind of I think new degree of freedom is like scalar field. And so let us consider a simple case of the scalar field, okay? So, so in the gravity sector, I just consider like general relativity. And I consider some canonical scalar field with some potential. And so this is a very known kind of potential. So this is R is a rich scalar. And this is known as Einstein Hilbert action. So this is general relativistic action. And this X is the kinetic term of the scalar field, which is defined like this, kinetic energy of the scalar field. And V is a potential energy. So this is Lagrangian. So just kinetic term minus V is Lagrangian, right? Yeah. Uh, this is a uh, Lagrangian action of the canonical scalar field with potential. Yes. And Yes, and this kind of theory is really applied to dark energy and dark matter. So in the case of dark energy, so this is called like quintessence, okay? And it can drive cosmic acceleration. So if there is a potential energy, so it works like cosmological constant. It's not really constant, but in this case, phi varies in time. 
And then, so it shows some signatures, actually, cosmologically. Yeah, and then, yeah, if the potential is sufficiently flat, it can drive cosmic acceleration. Also, for example, if V has some potential minimum, and if it oscillates on potential minimum, it works like dark matter, like, like axion kind of field, work like dark matter, some oscillating stuff, it work, work like dark matter. So these kind of theory are uh, yeah, often used for dark energy and dark matter kind of researches. Okay, so we can extend further, for example. So if the scalar field phi has a direct coupling to gravity, so R is actually captures the information of the gravity. And if phi is coupled to gravity in this way, like F phi R, so F is some function of phi, and so, and phi is actually coupled to rich scalar in this way. And this kind of theory is called scalar tensor theory. Yes. So now we have scalar field, right, here. And R is actually rich scalar. And R contains some tensor, information of tensor. In the first transparency I showed like that, right? So it contains some tensor kind of quantity, okay, geometric quantity like G mu. Nu. And actually this R contains two tensor degree freedom. And now, so this R is coupled to scalar field, then we call scalar theta theory, okay. And so the well-known example of the scalar theta theories is like Brunswick theories given by this action. So phi is coupled to R in this way. And we have, this looks <laughs> slightly strange home, <laughs> but this is the original notation of Brunswick and DK. And Yes, so actually I don't like this notation, so this looks quite strange, like phi is in the denominator, and there is kind of constant here, which is called Brunsky parameter. Okay, so, but actually we can write this action in a more um, convenient form, actually. Yes, that's what I do later. Yes. Yeah, anyway, so this is the original notation of Brunsky and DK. And this kind of theory, scalar tensor theories, like Brunsky theories, can encompass like F over gravity and also like Dilaton kind of gravity. Like in string theory, for example, so it gives rise to the coupling between scalar and tensor in this way. And typically, so F phi is like exponential function, like e to minus phi. And in that case, that's called Dilaton gravity. Okay. Yes. And those kind of theories, like Dilaton gravity and F over gravity, can be accommodated okay, in this action. This one. Yes. Right. So then, but this is a, actually one class of scalar tensor theories, yeah, this plastic theory. But actually you can generalize further, so you can construct some more kind of general theories where scalar field is coupled to, coupled to gravity. Then, yes, for example, so if you try to construct some kind of theories Okay, without some instabilities called Ostrogras instability. Actually, the theory is restricted like, uh, mm, okay, like kind of Horndensky kind of form. So in actually 73, the Horndensky drives the action of most general scalar tensor theories with second order equation with respect to a scalar phi and metric. Yes. So, so basically, so the, in the Horndensky theory, the equation motion with respect to scalar field phi and metric G menu is second order. I mean, it doesn't contain the derivative higher than second order. So that's called for necessary. And this second order property is desirable to avoid Ostrogorsky instability. So if the theory contains some derivative higher than second order, usually Hamiltonian is unbounded from below. So Hamiltonian can be really largely kind of negative. And those kind of property is actually give rise to some instability called Ostrogorsk instability. Yes. So then, yeah, then this kind of second order property is, is actually desirable yeah, to avoid this kind of instability. And then, the Hornetsk theory contains some four free functions. But uh, for example, if you actually try to apply this kind of theory to um, some gravitational wave kind of observation, for example, so we know that from the Newton star, Newton star binary observation, the speed of gravity is almost equivalent to actually speed of light. Then, then I want to consider those theories, so which respects the uh, speed of gravity constant. 
And then, then the action of the condensed theories is actually restricted to be home. So if you demand the information that CZ is equal to C, then the, now the theory is restricted to so. So yeah, basically we have no minimal coupling. Yeah, like a Brunswick case. And, and we also have this kind of case in this kind of term where G2 is a zero function of phi and X. This is called case sense. And also there is some kind of derivative kind of coupling, this kind of thing, which also appears. Originally, so this kind of stuff was studied by like uh, Galileon kind of context. So when G3 is X, it, it's called cubic Galileon. Okay. Yeah. So this kind of theory, okay, gives the value of speed of gravity equivalent to that of light. And we can further add some matter action here. So for example, we can test this kind of theory from the gravitational wave observation, like during inspiring phase, the wave form is actually modified, sorry, <laughs> modified, okay? So, I mean, in the case of GR, so G4 is just actually constant, right? But now there is no minimal coupling. We also have some kind of more general function like case sense, like G3 kind of function. So then this kind of theory gives some different prediction from that in GR. Then, okay, I want to actually test this kind of theory from the gradual wave method. Yes. yes. Basically, this kind of nominal coupling is usually quite dangerous because this actually mediates fifth sources with matter. Okay, through gravity, it's coupled. Basically, phi is coupled to Ritz scalar, and Ritz scalar is actually coupled to matter field through Einstein equation. So through gravitational, gravitational equation, R is actually related with like, the matter. So then scalar field is actually indirectly coupled to matter. Yes. It means that scalar field is coupled to baryon, so it mediates some fifth source. Okay. So then it can contradict with some solar system kind of experiment. So we have to be actually careful. <laughs> Okay, when you con consider this kind of theory. Yes. Anyway, so I mean, the gravitational interaction is actually modified from that in GR, okay? And, and then, so as I said already, so we don't know the gravitational interaction in the strong gravity regime. So I want to test whether this kind of modification of gravity is really allowed in the strong gravity environment. So I mean, we want to prove such modification in strong gravity regime through gravitational wave observation. Now we can do it. So it can be slightly technical. So, okay, let, let's, anyway, today I just consider this theory, basically, okay, this action, okay. So now, now so, yeah, basically, I, I, I can set like G3 is zero, so I don't consider this kind of function. So basically, I'm just considering some theory with G4R plus G2 pi X, yes. So now, so G4, for example, some coupling, nominal coupling. So let's consider this kind of nominal coupling. Plus like G2 is this function. Okay, this looks like quite, quite okay, slightly strange, but, uh, but this actually function is actually chosen, okay, to realize some kinetic term in the Einstein frame. So if you make some transformation called conformal transformation to the Einstein frame, so you can actually transform to the frame like in which nominal coupling is actually absent. So it's called Einstein frame. So if you make some comma transformation of the metric tensor in this way, and in the transform frame, so scalar field is not really coupled to rich scalar. That's called Einstein frame. And then in, in that Einstein frame, so if you choose a function of G2 in this way, then, then the action in the Einstein has a standard canonical kinetic term, like G2 is X hat. Yeah. So to get just just standard kinetic term in the Einstein frame, so I chose the function G2 in this way. So in that sense, it's not very really strange at all. <laughs> yeah. So in the, this is called Jordan frame. Okay. In the Jordan frame, G2 is this function, and after the transformation to the Einstein frame, we have we just have standard kinetic term in the Einstein frame. Yes. And so if you consider this kind of theory, so it can accommodate like Brunswick theories. For example, if you choose this nominal coupling. Actually, I, I, I prefer this form of Brunswick theories. So including some coupling Q, okay. And then, so 
So when Q is zero, it's GR. So if you set Q is zero, F is one. So it means that this become one. Then it means that this is just Einstein Hill reduction. So by taking the limit like Q is zero, so you recover GR. But now Q is not zero. And this coupling constant Q is, is related to the Braske parameter, omega BD, in this way. So Q is zero limit is a GR limit. So if you use this relation, Q is zero limit means that omega BD goes to infinity. So basically, yeah, that's original notation plus TK. Sorry. So omega BD is infinity is a GR limit. But uh, here, I want to use this notation Q. And Q is zero limit is GR. So that, that's easy to be understood, right? I mean, when Q is zero, this X become one, and we recover Einstein Q reduction. So that's better, I think. <laughs> yes. That's the reason why I want to use this kind of notation without using like omega BD stuff. Yeah. And also, there are some kind of theories with um, spontaneous polarization in the scalar field. Okay, this was considered by Damo and Espresso Farese in 93. So if you consider this kind of nominal coupling, which contain like a phi square term okay, in the power of exploration function, and, and then you have some GR branch appears. So there are two branches which can appear, especially in the strong gravity regime. So we have GR branch, okay. And we also have non-vanishing, okay. So basically phi is zero branch, and the other branch is non-vanishing phi branch. And actually, so these people like Damana Space Fire, they found that in the strong gravity regime, the GR branch, I mean phi is zero, can be unstable to reach the other non-trivial branch. Okay. This is called spontaneous scalarization. Yeah. This is actually an interesting phenomenon. So basically in the weak gravity regime, so the solution is actually stays at phi zero, stays like GR kind of regime. But uh, in the strong gravity regime, actually R become large, this R here become large. So there are some tachyonic instability when beta is actually negative. And then, so spontaneously, so GR branch can be unstable and it reaches some non other non vanishing phi branch. So this is a phenomenon in the strong gravity regime. So, I mean, in weak gravity regime, basically it, it's almost the same as GR. Yeah, but only in the strong gravity regime, some difference from GR actually appears yes, because of the phenomenon of spontaneous scalarization. So now, so through gravitational wave measurement, we can test this kind of you know, these theories, both like Brask theories and theory with spontaneous scalarization. I see. So, okay. So I want to quantify some information that some, for example, black hole or neutron star are scalarized. So if, if there are some kind of non vanishing phi solution, so then it affects actually black hole and the neutron stars, like a mass and also spin and other stuff. Okay. Then, yeah, then actually I want to find out some sort of deviation from GR so by considering this kind of theory. So for example, let's consider like static spherical symmetric hairy neutron stars, okay? So yeah, here, yeah, I consider like a static and spherical symmetric metric where F and H is a function of radius R, okay? And I introduce some like, like five fluid matter, low is the density and P is the pressure. So this is the energy momentum tensor of the matter. Yes. Then, for example, so if you consider the previous theory, so I, I just consider this kind of theory, okay, I focus on this kind of theory. Then, okay, you find that this metric component, F, H, and also scalar field phi, and the pressure P can be ex expanded. So, so now I'm considering some like neutron star in a strong gravity regime, and metric F and H is actually affected by the nominal coupling. So here you see some effect of nominal coupling. So in GR, this is absent, but now we have this like F comma phi is a derivative F with respect to phi actually appears. And also here you can see that, okay, there are some variation of the scalar field, okay, around the center of body. So I'm doing some expansion around the center of the neutron star, and you see that phi is not constant anymore because of the presence of nominal coupling. So phi actually changes as a function of R here. Actually decreases, okay. So now here we have some contribution nominal coupling. 
So yeah, the pressure also changes. So the pressure, matter pressure is modified by the normal coupling. Then the neutron star radius is actually modified because the radius of neutron star is determined by the condition like P is, is actually zero. So usually the radius of some star is determined by the condition that P vanishes. So, but now P is affected by normal coupling. So the radius of the star is also affected by the normal coupling. Yes. So, so if the radius of the star changes, okay, by the modification of gravity, the neutron star mass is also subject to modification by the normal coupling. Yes. Yes. So basically this kind of presence of normal coupling affects the radius and mass of the neutron star. So yeah. Yes. And then so so we can test those kind of modification, yes, from gravitational waves. For example, so to quantify some modification gravity, so I want to define some quantity, which is called scalar charge, okay? So now the mass, I, I mentioned that the mass of the star is modified, and usually, so we, we actually define the ADA mass of a star, which is related to the metric component here, H. Yeah. And so I take some limits that are equal to infinity, and this is the mass of ADA mass of a star. And so now, so the, I'm considering a situation that the star is actually scalarized. So, I mean, star is affected by the effect of scalar field. Then in that case, scalar field, yes. So, charge carried by the scalar field, yes. It, this is like electric magnetic field has a kind of electric charge, right? So now it's actually, star is actually scalarized. In that case, scalar field has a charge, okay then that kind of scalar charge actually can be constrained through the observation. So then, so as I mentioned already, so the previous action can be transformed to the Einstein frame under conformal transformation. So in the Einstein frame, it's very simple. So the previous action after the conformal transformation, it, it's like this form. So now I have just Einstein Hilbert action in the Einstein frame, and we, we only have the kinetic term okay, in that frame after this kind of transformation of the metric. So we have this kind of action. Yes, so then, so far away from the star, so you can easily show that for this kind of action, okay, so we only have just kinetic time for the scalar field. Then in that case, we find that the solution on the static and circular back background is like this, phi is like phi zero minus QS over R hat, okay. And if QS is zero, phi is just constant, then in that case, I mean, it doesn't play any role. I mean, scalar field doesn't play any role but if QS is non-zero, okay, then phi varies as a function of R. So in that case, we say that the star has a kind of scalar charge. Okay. So I mean, when QS is non-zero, okay, we say that scalar field has a scalar charge. Yes, I mean star, or a star has a scalar charge. Yes, so if you have some neutron star, and like a hairy neutron star, okay, with non vanishing scalar field profile, so QS doesn't vanish. And then, so, yeah, I, I, I can use QS, for example, for the computation graph show wave, but uh, it's more convenient to introduce some uh, dimensionless quantity, which I call alpha hat here. And kinetic term here is actually modify the ADA mass of the star. So outside the star, is actually kinetic term is actually present. This doesn't vanish, and it contributes to the ADA mass which is in the Einstein frame in this way, because ADA mass is defined in this way. So ADA mass is defined, okay, from the metric component, and I take the limit like R go to infinity. So even outside the star, scalar field doesn't vanish, so it contributes to the mass of the star. And as a Lagrangian, it contributes in this way, and you can show that this scalar charge QS is actually can be expressed in this form. Okay, now I introduce some new quantity, which I call alpha hat, and alpha hat is kind of m hat. Uh, m hat is a uh, area mass in the Einstein frame. Okay, so uh, this is dimensionless kind of quantity, and QS, uh, actually scalar charge, it can be expressed in this way, okay. in terms of alpha hat dimensionless quantity. Yes, and I, I, I want to use this kind of dimensionless quantity to quantify scalar charge, so instead of QS, I use alpha. So in the Einstein frame, so this is a solution at spatial infinity. So basically, 
phi varies as a function of r at. And if you go back to the Einstein frame, I have extra kind of factor here. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So it's slightly it's kind of technical, but, but anyway, so this is not difficult at all. So just from this action, yeah, just get the equation most of the scalar field. And if you solve that equation, so you have this solution. Okay. Okay. And then you can relate this QS okay, by using this kind of contribution. Hmm. Yeah. We can show this kind of correspondence. So basically, I use this out of hat in the following. Okay. So, for example, so original model of the one is for this is is here. So I explain here about that. So consider the theory is given by the coupling kind of function, like G two is like this. And here, so in the original theory of the Damon is for this mu two is actually zero. But now I take into account high order kinetic term. Okay. And then, yeah, and then, for example, if you consider kind of like a neutron star configuration, and, if, and by specifying some equation of state of neutron star, so you can compute the field, actually, field derivative as a function of R. So, for example, when mu2 is zero, the original model of one is squared square is it? So you find some kind of scalar field profile. So phi prime increases as a function of r, it grows in this way. And this is around the surface of a star. And outside the star, it starts to decay, actually, in this way. So basically, around the surface of a star, so phi prime is become largest. And at large distances, phi prime decreases. But, but the important point is that at large distances, phi prime actually varies as a function of r. And because of the presence of scalar charge, Okay, and here, I mean, the QS is non-zero, and then I can compute like alpha hat, yes, and this is uh, alpha hat as a function of AD mass, yes. And you can see that in the original Tamo I squeeze for the model, this scalar charge alpha hat become really large, like of order like point, point 0.3, yes. Yes, so then actually this kind of quantity can be constrained from ground wave measurement. i talk later. Yes, yeah, so actually this kind of large value of alpha hat is really under observation pressure. I cannot say that this is really ruled out in the current observation, but uh, yeah, but uh, I'm sure so it's possible to exclude this original model of the one squeeze for because of the large okay, scalar charge minus alpha hat. So this is too large value. And yeah, we, yeah, if you try to do some likelihood analysis by using some data, so typically, Aroha hat is smaller than about that point 0.1, but uh, the more space far as the model give rise to some value, like Aroha hat is over 0.3, it's too large. So we consider some specific kind of scenario, like kinetic screening. screening. So if you take into account like mu x square term here in the Lagrangian, so, and then this actually suppresses this actual scalar charge. So this is called kinetic screening, we say. So in the stern gravity regime, so it's possible to suppress the okay, amount of the actual scalar charge. Hmm. Yeah, this is called kinetic screening. Yes. So this kind of kinetic screening with spontaneous scalarization can be also tested yeah, from ground wave measurement. So if you choose some larger value of mu2, so this r phi hat decreases. And also like phi prime also decreases here. Right. So, so actually, this, this is a story for neutron star. Actually, so this one is uh, we really require some matter so to realize spontaneous scalarization. Okay, in this kind of theory, Not a theory with nominal coupling, we really require some matter source like neutron star. Okay, okay to lead to the spontaneous scalarization. But in the case of black holes, so. What, what happens? So the question is that what happens for black hole? Are there any kind of hairy black hole solution? I mean, hairy black hole solution means that the um, scalar field is non vanishing. Okay? And also, the metric is aff usually affected by the presence of scalar field. That's what I call like hairy black hole, for example. And the question is that are there some hairy black hole solution for the following subclass of foreign theories? So I'm Considering this kind of foreign theories, 
with speed of gravity is equivalent to C. And if you consider like static scar field like phi is a function and radius r, there are no hairy black hole solution known in the literature. Yeah. yeah, so I mean I mean it just reduces Schwarzschild solution. I mean so in GR we have Schwarzschild solution, right? On the static silica single background. And phi phi prime is zero in GR. And one may wonder whether there are some hairy solutions where phi prime doesn't vanish. Also, the metric is modified okay, from Schwarzschild. So I want to find out those kind of cases. But quite surprisingly, <laughs> so in this kind of theories, there are no hairy black hole solutions known in the literature. Actually, there's a kind of long history. So the first one is in the early 70s, like Bekenstein, Hawking. So they consider like minimal couple of scars with plus GR. So this is very simple. Like G2 is just uh, X minus V, okay? And uh, gravity sector is GR. And these kind of people actually show that there is no scalar here. We end up with Schwarzschild solution. Hello. Siti, may I ask yes. some? Yes. Uh, how you distinguish between uh, black hole solution and Newton uh, solutions? Ah, so black hole basically doesn't have any matter. So it doesn't have any. It is so in the vacuum. So yeah, T minu is zero for black hole. Yeah, but the whole neutron star T minu is actually there. A row and P is there. Yeah. Black hole is basically vacuum. There is just scar field. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that makes a difference. Yeah. So usually it's the hairy solution for black hole. Neutron star is easy to have hairy one. Yeah. So yeah. So this actually this is the case for, for this kind of theory. Yeah. So in Newton's mm -hmm. style, you just mm -hmm. have the function to specify to get a solution somehow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the case of black hole, even if you specify some function, so we don't have, at least for this kind of theory, you don't have. Yes. Yeah. For example, if you consider like Gauss Bonde, there are many actual black hole, Gauss Bonde black hole. In that case, there are hairy solutions. But this theory, okay, doesn't actually contain like Gauss Bonde theory. Yeah, we, you have to add additional kind of function like G5. So, I mean, Hornet theory is more general. So we have like G5 function. Uh, if you introduce those functions, they are hairy solution. Yeah, but the whole this kind of function, surprisingly, yeah. Last year, I really tried to find that hairy solution for this kind of theory. But uh, at least for the regular function, like uh, when G2 and G3 and G4 is a regular function phi and x, they are like, like phi to n, and n is positive, and x to n, and n is positive. We really didn't find any hairy solution in the literature. Yeah, I mean, I mean, phi prime is always zero. Yeah, surprisingly, yes. Yeah, so there are many actual proof like this, but uh, nobody did it in a more general way. So in the last year, we actually generally kind of proved that, yeah, at least for general regular function for this kind of theory, we really don't have any hairy solution. So it's really restricted. So even in the most general von Neske theories, we, we only find, only in the case of gauss bonnet term is present, we find the hairy solution. If the gauss bonnet term is present, then we can add any other function. So, but uh, we really require gauss bonnet term to realize hairy black hole solution. That's what we find, yeah. So yeah, yeah, but, but in some sense it's good. So in this kind of theory, so basically neutron star, can have hairy neutron star, but black hole has no hair. Yeah, so there are some difference between black hole and neutron star. Yeah, so we can test this kind of theory from observation. Yeah, that's what I told. So, yeah, yeah, this, this is, a, yeah, sorry. So basically, hmm. so I want to test this kind of theory from gravitational wave observation. So the, in that case, it's ideal to use some kind of neutron star black hole binary system. Because there are some difference in terms of scalar charge. So neutron star is out of high hat is non-vanishing, but black hole is actually zero. Yes. So it's, it's actually ideal to use neutron star black hole binary system. If you use just black hole black hole binary system for this kind of theory, so it's nothing, you know. It's like GR, the same as GR. Because both alpha B hat is zero for black hole black hole. But if one of them is neutron star, so we have non-vanishing out of high hat, so we can distinguish. Of course, and neutron star, neutron star binary. So in that case, also you can test this kind of theory. 
Yes. And then, so in the gradual waveform, so the difference between scalar charges appears, like delta alpha hat, is alpha hat minus alpha hat, actually appears in the gradual waveform. Actually, this comes from the energy loss of scalar radiation present in our theory. So if you consider this kind of start in the theory, there is kind of scalar radiation besides gravitational radiation. And then it actually modifies gravitational wave spectrum quite a lot. Then we can test theories. And plus, if you consider this kind of scalar in the theories, so besides tensor polarization, like H plus and H cross, there are also additional scalar polarization which can be proved from observation. So there are some scalar polarized mode. So, I mean, there are additional polarized mode which can be tested. So far, we didn't detect it any kind of scalar mode. So we can put some constant okay, from observation. So basically, setup is like this. Okay, now so I'm considering like, I'm interested in some black hole neutron star binary. Okay, and the neutron star is actually scalarized. Okay, this one, and black hole, is not scalarized, so yeah. And then they are rotating each other like this. And, and I'm considering in spiral phase of the neutron star black hole binary, and it emits gravitational wave like this. And now we are here, over, over here, and yeah, I arrived here. I'm considering this. This is very <laughs> realistic situation that because neutron star black hole actually binary system was found three years ago, <laughs> actually. So yeah, then we also have a gravitational waveform in the neutron star black hole binary system. Yes, yeah, so this is really realistic system nowadays, actually. So, okay, so we deal with a binary system, a circular orbit, yeah. And actually orbit can be circular. This is really good approximation, actually. And we deal with this neutron star black hole binary system as a collection of two point particles with masses MA and MB, okay? This is a simple system. So this is kind of point particle, and the action of the point particle, this is well known. So this is just like integral of MI with respect to the proper time. So yeah, this is a point particle this description of the, the Newton standard black hole. And then, so as I mentioned already, so I want to use this dimensionless parameter for the scalar charge. Okay, this is very, very related with the scalar charge. Okay. And MI hat is a uh, area mass in the Einstein phase. Okay, yes, so yeah, if the star is scalarized, this MI hat has a phi dependence, and then other hat is not there. So that's the case of neutron star, but not the case of black hole, yes. Maybe, maybe this setup is just simple, it's just rotate. So as I said already, so this theory like rotates like, uh, okay, 50 times per second, the typical value is around 50 times per second, I mean, Frequency is like 50 hertz, because it rotates very fast. Yeah, it's amazing fast speed. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but still the velocity, velocity is quite large. For example, in this kind of okay, binary system, neutron star black hole binary, so actually velocity, okay, doesn't reach the speed of light, but uh, it, can, it can be like 0.1 c. I mean, c is, is the speed of light and this kind of rotational velocity can be typically of order like 0.1c, which, which is already quite large, yes. Right, so, so basically, so I have to consider a kind of uh, uh, propagation of gravitational waves, so because pro gravitational wave propagate, okay, from binary to the observer. So then in doing so, we expand the metric g menu and scalar field in this form, so g menu, is actually the mean coxie actually space time. So this is after the emission. So after the emission, basically I'm considering some mean coxie background plus some perturbation. This H menu is a is gravitational wave, yeah, the perturbation. Now, strictly speaking, I have to consider cosmological background, basically. Yeah, but you can extend the analysis to the cosmological background. Yes. Yeah, actually, I also did recently about that, but it only modifies the uh, amplitude. So basically, it's not really essential. So basically, if you consider mean coxie background, then it's really easy to extend the coxie background. Yeah. And the result is that it modifies amplitude, not phase time. Yes. So basically, we can consider some scalar field. So this is some asymptotic value, and the background value, I can say, plus some perturbation. So there are two perturbations. So one is Gaussian wave, it's minute. 
the metric perturbation, and phi is the perturbation of the scarfing. So for each of them, I have the linearized equation. So at linear order, I can obtain the following perturbation equation from the theory. So basically, I have action, okay? Then I can derive the field equation motion. So this is a gravitational equation motion, okay? And the Minkowski backup. And for example, there is an issue of gauges. So, but I can choose some Lorentz gauge, for example. Okay. Then, so basically, this T mini one is a first order matter energy momentum tensor. Okay. So, if there is a kind of neutron star black hole coalescence, oh, this can be very large. So, it works as a source term for the gravitational wave C T mini. Yeah. And then, C T mini is, this is kind of gauge invariant quantity. So, H mini combined with some kind of scalar field perturbation. So I call this one the theta menu. And by introducing this kind of quantity and by fixing the gauge like Lorentz gauge, then I can derive this simple equation. This is a very simple equation motion. And G4 is defined this way. This is a kind of uh, phi dependence normal coupling actually affects this quantity. And regarding uh, uh, scalar field equation motion, so I have this one, but phi satisfies this equation. And again, I have source term on the right-hand side, so this kind of matter actually affects this stuff. Yes. Mm. But in the case of black hole, actually, this is actually this zero. Yeah, so then we actually end up with no hair solution. But in the case of neutron stars, this, this T1 is a trace of the matter energy momentum tensor. It's actually non And then we can realize some non-balancing scalar field profile, so in this case, for perturbation. We have some non balancing body. Yeah, and theta zero, et cetera, is defined this way. And MS is a mass of the scar field, which is defined this way. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, I have just two equations, so which I need to solve yes, to deal with some propagation. It's fine. Yes. Uh, I use a, a notation like C is one here. So basically, I mean, this theory give some speed of gra gravitational wave equivalent to that of C. So I set C is one. So then there is a solution to tensor gravitational waves. So this is the solution to tensor gravitational wave. So if there is a source, T mini one, like black hole neutron star binary, so this is actually large. So then, so this becomes source term for the gravitational waves. And then now, so for example, so the calculation is quite actually lengthy. It's quite complicated calculation. But, uh, Anyway, so I expand this energy momentum tensor around the retarded time T minus T. So D is a distance from the binary to the observer. And also there are some kind of conserved property of the matter energy momentum tensor. And now I'm considering point particle for the energy momentum tensor. So T00 is like this. So by substituting this kind of relation, I get this one. Okay. This is known as quadratic quadrupole formula of gravitational waves. So basically, she ties J is inversely proportional to D, so D appears here. So D is a distance from the binary to the observer. So for the large distance, it's really strongly suppressed. I mean, the amplitude is really inversely proportional to D. So for example, when D is like, uh, okay, like 100 megaparsec, typically this amplitude of the wave is of order like 10 to minus 20. So it's very difficult to detect. But amazingly, so LIGO detected actually gravitational waves, even with some small kind of amplitude they detected. Right, so yeah. So basically, so you can learn something. So it, it coin, contains the information of the distance here and also normal coupling here. And also this MI is a mass of the neutron star and black hole kind of binary. So yeah, MA is a mass of neutron star and MV is a mass of the black hole. And also X, Xi here is a position of the neutron star black hole. So it actually depends on how the neutron star black hole actually rotate. Yeah. It carries the information of how they move actually. So I mean, so I have to consider the kind of equation motion of the neutron star black hole binary system. Okay. So then it really affects the gravitational wave kind of okay. spectrum. So then, for example, so Newtonian solution, okay, just consider some Newtonian kind of graph here. So uh, basically, this is a leading order kind of post-Newtonian approximation. So if you want to make some kind of precise kind of precision, so people typically use like post-Newtonian, I mean, the 
velocity of the binary system is actually smaller than speed of light. So I mean, v, v over C is actually smaller than one. And then, so people actually use those kind of expansion. Okay, V over C kind of expansion. That's called post-Newtonian approximation. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, yeah. But this is actually reading all that kind of contribution I estimated. Yes. Actually, to make really pre okay, <laughs> precise, actually, prediction, so you have to consider, like, higher order post-Newtonian term. But, uh, I'm, here, I'm just interested in the reading all that kind of term, so, yeah. And then the actual formula become very simple. So if you really work, work out like high order post neutron term, it, you have really many terms which appears here, which I don't like here. Yeah. So, okay, this, I'm just considering simple system of the binary. So it's just circular orbit of the binary system. Yes, it's just moving like this, okay. So the center of mass is basically actually conserved. So yeah, this is just a binary system. Okay. Uh, gravity actually works okay. between okay to neutron star and binary abacore. core. So basically, the momentum is conserved. So center of mass is actually zero. So without loss of generality, I can say that center of mass is zero okay, because of the momentum conservation. And also the relative movement between two binaries. So this is well known. So this is Newton mechanics. So I think you, you know very well that this is reduced mass mu. Okay, is a kind of okay, force okay, between two, between the binary system. But here G hat is actually modified. In G G R and Newton gravity just one. But now I'm considering scalar tensor theories. So actually correction from the scalar charge appears here. So actually. Yeah, gravitational coupling is actually modified by the scalar charge. So this is actually different from one. So then, but, the, but if you introduce G hat in this way, so I can write this theta j in a very simple manner. So basically, so this xi, et cetera, is the position of the neutron star and black hole. So basically, it affects finally in this way. So this is kind of relative velocity between neutron star and black hole, and ri hat, ri, hat here is a relative displacement of the neutral standard and black hole binary system here. Yeah, basically it's quite simple, finally, yes. So basically this gravitational wave actually carries the information of the relative velocity and relative displacement of the binary system, right? You can see it here. And also it's inversely proportional D, yes. So it carries the information of the distance here, yeah, like this. So, right. Maybe I shouldn't end that so much detail. So, okay, so you can drive solution to the scalar field equation motion. So if you're interested, you can have a look at my actual paper. And so now there's a source term on the right-hand side. And then I finally, up to quadrupole order in the post newtonian expansion, I can obtain this kind of solution. So phi is a kind of sum of phi b plus phi m. And phi b and phi m is given by this. And yeah, and phi b is kind of massless mode. So if you take the limit that mass of the scalar is zero, this phi m vanishes, basically. So phi m comes from the massive contribution of the scalar field. So if you consider just massless scalar field, phi m vanishes. So you just need to worry about phi b here. Yes. So phi b actually contain like a monopole, monopole mode and dipole mode and quadrupole mode. Yes. And multiple mode is kind of constant mode. So basically, we, we don't need to worry much. And but what affects the gravitational wave, waveform is like dipole and quadrupole contribution. So this actually, yeah, affects the gravitational waveform. Yes, so basically, this V is a relative velocity between two binaries, uh, between binary, one binary, sorry. And R is a relative displacement between the binary, okay? Okay, and so it's complicated actually. And, and there are some functions like gamma, et cetera, here, which I define this way. Yeah, this is quite complete calculation, so I have to spend more than, more than one month or even more, more, even more <laughs> to do this kind of calculation actually. So yeah, right. So this is a solution to the scar heat pattern. Basically, what I did is just simple. So if 
First, is I derive the solution to the tensor aggression of x. But now I have some kind of scalar field perturbation. So I derive two solutions, basically, right? Yes. OK. And then, so I have tensor and scalar aggression wave in this kind of theory. So in Einstein gravity, I only have tensor aggression wave, but I'm considering scalar tensor theory. So I have scalar aggression wave besides tensor aggression wave. OK. Yes. I have actually four polarization mode, tensor and scalar aggression wave. So, okay, I can define some gravitational wave field, okay, from the uh, Riemann tensor in this way. They are usually, yeah, people define this way. Gravitational wave field is actually geodesic deviation. So you can define some, uh, okay, this is a kind of geodesic deviation equation, okay, which contains some Riemann, component of Riemann tensor. Okay, and that actually appears here. And usually, so we define the gravitational wave field by using this kind of geodesic deviation relation. And at linear order in H minus, so I find that R0, I0, I0, I0 is of this form. So yeah, it actually contains like Hij and Hz0. And for example, so we can choose some gauge, like trace test transverse gauge called TT gauge. So this is a kind of TT gauge. Okay. That, that, this is the very basic stuff on gravitational wave. And then sheet IJ is defined this way. And finally, so, yeah, I get this one. Okay, and right hand side is this one. So it contains basically a stress mode of gravitational wave plus some scalar field perturbation buffer here. And buffer is 5e plus 5 in this way. And finally, so using this kind of property, so this left hand side can be written this way. So I have tensor mode, sheet ITT mode, trace S transverse mode. And I have actually kind of scalar mode, which come from scalar perturbation. And also final one come from massive kind of scalar field. So if the mass of the scalar field is non-vanishing, so there is an additional comp contribution which come from massive scalar field. So basically there are four polarized modes in this kind of theory. So in terms of some polarization, so yeah, for example, if you consider like three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate like x, y, z, and if you consider the gravitational wave progression along the z direction, so we find that this unit vector component, nz is just one, and nx and ny is zero. So we can express the gravitational wave field in this form, okay, h plus h cross, this is a usual one, h plus h cross is a usual gravitational wave, and now I have breathing and longitudinal kind of polarization, which come from scalar field perturbation. So you can have a look at here. So this is a H plus mode. So yeah, it oscillates in this way. So you can have a look at this figure. Okay. And H cross is uh, inclined compared to this H plus mode. This is inclined at 45 degrees. Okay, and it oscillates so in this way. And yeah, and this is a huge version of webbing, which is similar to GR. But now I have some additional mode, which is called breathing mode, scalar breathing mode. So the polarization pattern is different from the H plus mode. So it, yeah, it's actually oscillate in the same manner in both X and Y direction. So this is called breathing scalar mode. Yes. And I also have, this is kind of longitudinal propagation. So along the Z direction, if the scalar field massive, so there is a kind of breaking of symmetry. So we have some propagation along the z direction. So that's called kind of scalar longitudinal mode. Yeah, so compared to GR, we have additional kind of two modes, so which can be tested from observation. Yes. Right. So, okay. So, okay, finally I compute some gravitational waveform for constant frequency. So I use the approximation that at frequency is actually constant. Actually, this is not the case, but uh, I first use the approximation that frequency is just constant, okay? And I later I consider the case like frequency actually changes. So for the constant orbital frequency like omega two by f, tensor waveform, okay, I like this. So finally it becomes quite simple, so yeah after doing some calculations, so I 
can get this kind of result. And here, the MC is called chap mass, and phi is some phase, and phi is given by omega t mass t. Okay. And there are two modes, okay, like this. Okay, and so it basically delta is depend on kind of scalar charge, and this star depends on the sun, and the cup hole is defined this way. Okay. So actually we can measure this one. And in GR, delta is actually zero. So in GR, this delta is zero because alpha hat and alpha hat is zero. So this becomes just one. And G star is, yeah, is also constant in GR, yeah. And so, yeah, so basically the difference is not much from GR. So if you just have a look at this okay, Gravity waveform or constant frequency, the difference from GR is not actually not significant. It just appears in delta here. Yeah, but I assume that this F is constant. Yeah, but that's not the case. So I showed already the figure that F actually increases in time, right? So during inspire phase, it actually F increasing in time. But here I just assume that F is constant, but that's not true. So, so basically I have to consider the effect that F increases. Then those kind of effects, okay, can really affect uh, this gravitational waveform. Here it's actually modified by that effect. So, ah, okay, so before doing that, so I, I have to mention what scalar gravitational waves. So there is a breathing mode like HB and also longitudinal mode like HL here. Okay, so yeah. So actually this is something opposite to the context of inflation. So in the case of inflation, so scalar mode is detected, uh, CMB detected scalar mode, but tensor mode, gravitational wave is not detected in the CMB observation. So people actually define like tensor to scalar ratio <laughs> in the context of inflation. But this is something opposite. So in the case of like this black hole, black hole, black hole Newton subbinary system, so <laughs> tensor mode are detected already, but scalar mode are not detected. So I can define the scalar to tensor ratio in this way, like HB divided by H plus by H, H cross, okay, RB I call, and RL, HL divided by H plus H cross, okay. Yeah, so in, in the future, so basically, I'm quite sure that people try to put some kind of constraint on this kind of stuff, yes, yeah. Actually, in the context of inflation, so people, like little and rice, I think they, first introduced this kind of quantity, like tensor to scalar ratio, 93 or 94. But at that time, people didn't think that those kind of, okay, CMB temperature anisotropy can be detected. People didn't think that, okay, they are, de they are detected, but actually detected. And at that time, people are not really interested in this kind of quantity, like tensor to scalar ratio. But after the, I mean, WMAP data are released, people start to use this kind of, I mean, tensor scalar ratio. Yeah, they try to put some constant. Yes. So maybe I hope in the future, so this kind of quantity can be important. And something similar to inflation, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. so far, the data is not so I mean, precise compared to like CMB measurements. So yeah, people are not really interested in this kind of stuff much. But, uh, but now we start to get some data, although the data is not really precise, so yeah. I'm sure yeah, in the future people try to put some constraint okay, by using this kind of formula. So basically, so I mean, scalar wave is not found for this kind of binary system. So the detection of scalar waves, scalar gravitational wave, allow us to put constraint on the scalar charge and the normal coupling. Yes. So basically, we can put some kind of constraint on scalar charge. So this contains some scalar charge here, like alpha hat, for example. Also, G4 is actually depend on nominal coupling. So basically, so if the scalar gravitational waves are detected, so we can put some really tight constraint on the scalar charge and nominal coupling. Okay, that's really good, yeah, to put some constraint on this kind of thing. So finally, so, okay, I, I talk about the gravitation. So I mentioned that I use approximation that frequency is constant, but that's not true, actually. <laughs> actually, the orbital frequency increases by the gravitational radiation plus scalar radiation, yes. So in GR, actually, there is a kind of gravitational radiation, and then that actually induces some growth of the frequency, okay. And in scalar tensor theory, so we also have gravitational radiation, and we, but, but besides that, we also have scalar radiation, yes. So we have to take into account two effects. 
So to quantify those kind of radiations in scar tensor series, I compute the effective gravitational wave source energy tensor. So this is a source energy tensor of the gravitational wave. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is also quite complete calculation. Yeah. Without using like um, mathematical maple, it's quite complicated. But finally, we got this kind of simple results. Okay. And this is actually conserved quantity. So this is like T minus. So basically, that we satisfy continuity equation. And the gravitational wave energy is actually defined this way. T00 is like, like, like energy density. So, so then we can define EGW in this way. So if you take the time derivative of EGW, so we find this one. Okay. So this becomes like surface kind of integral. Ah, this, I use some continuity equation T minus. And then this is a volume integral, but it can change to a surface integral. Okay, and I get this one. So I, so, I mean, T0i is non-vanishing, and then, so, E dot GW is actually non-zero, yeah. So, basically, I mean, there is a gravitational wave emission, and then it will really affect some frequency of the binary system. So, the energy associated with the binary system is actually, this is like Newton formula, <laughs> okay, this is just, uh, okay, kinetic, uh, okay, kinetic term, kinetic energy, and this is a potential energy. And then in the case of circular orbit, so I, I find that E is like this. So if you have a look at this formula, so the orbital frequency omega change in time due to the decay of E induced by the energy loss, EGW. Because, because of the gravitational emission, so basically, so the energy of the binary system actually changes. So because of energy conservation, E dot is actually E dot GW. Yes, so now I, I have E dot GW, okay. And then, so E dot is actually depend on omega dot, okay. And if you do some calculation, you can show that omega dot is actually changing in this way. I mean, omega is not constant because of gravitational radiation. Because E dot GW is non-zero, so basically omega dot is non-zero. I mean, omega increases in time. So basically, in the case of GR, this is the GR result. The first one is just GR result. So it means that this is positive, so omega dot is positive, so omega increases. So in the inspired phase, omega increases in time. Okay. Yes. But now, so I have, okay, additional one, scalar radiation here, okay, which contain like scalar charge here. Yes, so besides gravitational radiation, I have some additional scalar radiation, so which really affects this kind of change of omega. And especially if omega is larger than ms over two, the scalar radiation is non-vanishing. So this is a kind of theta function. So basically, as long as omega is larger than ms over two, so this doesn't vanish. So then this scalar radiation actually contributes to the variation of omega, actually, yeah. So finally, so maybe I don't, I don't need to mention some detail, but I did some sort of approximation called stationary phase approximation. So basically, in the, actually, to, in the data analysis of gravitational waves, it is common to perform a free Fourier transformation in gravitational wave with frequency f. So, for example, for the tensor plus mode, so I I go to free space. So now I have some h plus mode, but I make the Fourier transformation this way. Okay. Then if I expand here like e, I multiply to by f t, so I can write in this way. And here, if you have a look at here, there is a stationary phase point for the second term. And actually this term actually vanishes, ah, not vanishes, the time derivative of this term vanishes, which I call stationary phase point. And stationary phase point is here, omega is in one to pi f, okay. And basically, so the first term is actually oscillate very fast, so I can actually drop it. So it actually doesn't contribute to the final gravitational waveform. And I can expand phi t around the This is okay in this kind of analysis. And finally, so by dropping this fast oscillating term, so I get the uh, uh, gravitational wave from h plus zero that, and which depends on like omega d to t like this. And phi psi plus is phase term, and phase term is like this. Okay, so I, I introduce some time t c at which omega increases sufficiently large. So yeah. Yeah, because at, at final phase of inspire, 
this omega is actually grows sufficiently large. So I denote that time at TC, like this. Yes. And then, so under this kind of approximation, so I just, now I have omega dot, right? Omega dot, previous transparency, I got omega dot here. So, but now, so under stationary phase approximation, so here, omega dot appears here, and also omega dot appears here. So I use the previous version here. And then I can compute the Gaussian waveform. And also phase here, finally. So this is a final result. So taking the leading order correction to omega dot, okay, arising from the modification to gravity. So I have this kind of term. Okay. So, so I have some modification here, of which come from some sculpture. Some difference of the sculpture appears. So R Y hat is a sculpture of the neutron star, and R B hat is a sculpture of black hole. And the difference of the sculpture appears in the Gaussian waveform. Also the phase. Okay, here, C plus has to carry the information of the sculpture here. And this time it actually can be quite large. So this is, people say like minus one PN order. Okay. So this is actually C over V square. So then this can be really like a large contribution. Okay. So if this term is really large, it really modifies the gradual waveform significantly. So we can put some tight constraint so on, on this kind of term. Because, and because if our high hat is large, this term can be really large. Because C over V square is also multiplied. So this scalar charge cannot be so large, you know. <laughs> then it really modifies that GR, this one is GR contribution. So this cannot be large as one. So yeah, we can put some tight constraints on the value of our high hat. So as I said already, our high hat is non-zero for neutron star, and our heavy hat is zero with black hole. So vanishing scalar charge in neutron star modifies both amplitude phase of Gaussian wave. So basically, here is amplitude is modified, and also the phase of the Gaussian wave is modified. So, so basically, so in the current observation, so we can put some constraint from the phase. Phase is a kind of stronger constraint we can get. In terms of the amplitude, so we don't have the tight constant yet. Yes, but maybe change future, but in the current observation, the phase is kind of, we get some tighter constraint from the phase. So then we can put some kind of combination, for example, here, like root kappa four multiply alpha hat minus alpha hat can be really constrained from the gravitational wave observation. And this is a kind of theoretical part, and then, so this is really final one. So I'm just trying try to put some constraint. This is preliminary observation constraint, so we are working with this kind of people, in Japanese people. So basically, Okay, this is preliminary kind of constraint. So actually there is an event, black hole neutron star event. This is just one event we know called the black hole neutron star binary system. So GW20115, this is only the neutron star black hole event. Then we start to do some likelihood analysis by using a real kind of data. And I get this kind of constraint, okay. And MC is the chaff mass of the system. So the preliminary results show that this kappa four multiply alpha hat minus alpha hat is smaller than 0 0.05, okay? And for example, if you consider like theory, like brunswick decay and spontaneous scalarization, the kappa four is one over half. And in that case, alpha hat is smaller than 0 0.07, okay? So as I mentioned already, so Damo and Spritz Farese, typically alpha hat is larger than 0.1, like it can reach like 0.3. So then, Practically, so this is still preliminary, but uh, if you really get this kind of constraint, uh, yeah, then we can really strongly, I mean, constraint like Damo S plus far as a spontaneous scalarization model. But in the case of kinetic screen case, so alpha hat decreases. So even with this kind of bound, so it can satisfy the, the, this kind of bound. So, mm. so I mean, the original Damo S plus far as it may be ruled out. So if this is correct, but some kinetic screen with spontaneous scalation, okay, maybe still fine. So yeah, that's the reason why I consider some kinetic screen, yes. But this is just one event, but I'm sure that in the future observation, so we get some more data of the neutron star black hole binary system. So with the accumulation of data and with the precision of the data is increased, then this upper limit should be decreased further. So then, yeah, I mean, 
we can really okay, prove the signature of the modification gravity. Maybe we may not see anything, but at least this bound can be really tighter in the future observation. Yes. So this is <laughs> this conclusion. So basically the advent of the gravitational wave astronomy now allows us to prove physics in strong gravity regime. So basically we computed the gravitational wave form in the subclass of quantum theories with a luminal speed of gravitational wave to search for the deviation of GR. So the main difference of GR are two points actually. There are the breathing and longitudinal polarization arising from scalar field perturbation. Actually, we didn't find scalar polarization yet. Yes. So then, yeah. So this also gives some kind of new information so in, in future observation. And also the existence of scalar radiation actually modified the gradual wave for significantly for both phase and amplitude. And, and because of that, so we get this kind of tight constant here because of the change of the phase get this kind of constant. I'm sure this constant can be actually tightened in future measurement. Yes, so, so the accumulation of the data will allow us to prove signatures for the molecular gravity in the future. So, yes, so that's my conclusion, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's about question time. Uh, any questions Sorry, from it's the our people Sorry. in this room? Yeah, I, okay, uh, Chris? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, are there any people doing, uh, or for example, with the tensor theory or somehow it's pro-carb fields? pro Ah, pro generalized pro -carb. Yeah, yeah. No, not yet, actually. Not yet. Yeah, there are many things to do, actually. Uh, yeah. Are there any, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the hair, for example, mm -hmm. Are there any solution for? Yeah, yeah. At least you know, like uh, some vector tensor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like Einstein is a theory is also vector tensor. In that case, people, some people did it. Some people actually really computed with this kind of gradual waveform. Yeah, they did it. Yeah, but in the case of vector tensor, there is additional polarization, so it's more complicated. But at least, yeah, in the Einstein is a case, people did it. Compute like people like Nico units. People did. But in the case of Smoka, no, no, nobody did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, even in the Scarlet theory, so it's, it's not, not much. So, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, you can do it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I know, no, it is. Yeah. But additional polarization, so, yeah. So far, we can put some constraint up to one additional polarization. So, yeah. So, but in that vector tense theory, I think we have five polarization, right? Yeah. But, but, but still, anyway, it, it, it's good to predict anyway, theoretically, <laughs> so, yeah. So, so basically, so I think, I, I don't know. Yeah, but for example, if you consider the as poker theory, even black hole can have charges, vector charges. Yeah, so then maybe it affects something similar way. So for example, here, I have some comp contribution with scar charge. Yeah, yeah. But, but in the case of vector tense theory, for example, if the black hole has a kind of vector charge, so this alpha b hat is not zero. Yeah, and also, I mean, neutron stack can charge. So yeah, this alpha hat is not zero. I don't know whether it appears in a similar way to here. So just in the case of scalar tensor theory, I have this combination, but uh, in the vector tensor theory, something may be different, so yeah, yeah. And also this dependence is important. It contains some kind of F, right, free case dependence. This is not just constant. The free case dependence appears in this way, yeah. and then in that case, you can put really tight constants. Yeah, but vector tensor, if it appears in a different way, maybe interesting. Yeah. Typically, if you consider scalar tensor theory, the leading or the correction is like this. Yeah. But vector tensor, I'm not quite sure what happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, at least for the black hole, so I worked on that issue. And there are quite many black, hairy black hole solutions compared to scalar tensor theory. So yeah, yeah, then you can actually consider even black hole for this kind of stuff, yeah. Because in the case of scalar tensor theory, so I, yeah, I mean, black hole doesn't have hair in this kind of theory. So yeah, but uh, if you have some hairy black hole, so in the focus theory, so yeah, I mean, we can use a black hole, black hole event, right? So I have to restrict the analysis for neutron star black hole binary, so to the right vector. 
Yeah, but if black hole have hair, so you can extend more, much more. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting extension, yeah. Okay, um, any more questions? Maybe it's because um, maybe you're not so familiar with this kind of stuff. Actually, not many people working, to, well, to be honest. Uh, Chino? Chino? Yeah, anything is fine. So this is kind of really, yeah. But I hope, I think, yeah, people will start to work on this kind of issue because we start to get some data. So in terms of some theories, we should predict something. Yeah. Well, sorry, sorry. So, so actually, in my understanding, uh, maybe mm -hmm. hair is something mm -hmm. like, in the, in the observation, something mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. multi-mason, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so for this case, can I summarize something like, okay, for neutral star, neutral star, star mm -hmm. binary, we have uh, multi mason already. And uh, for neutral star, but, but after ring dark, after ring dark, if I have a uh, multi mason, the final state should, should not mm -hmm. be the right color. Mm -hmm. And uh, if a uh, neutron star, then neutron star, and they, they should have some event like after ring dark, we don't have multi mason. Yeah, I, actually, we don't have good data for that, but uh, there is a specific oscillation called quasi normal oscillation. And theoretically, people actually um, computed quasi normal kind of frequency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, so far we don't have data. Yeah, but I'm sure we can have the data in the future. So, yeah, then, yeah, we should make some theoretical prediction of that. At least for this kind of scattered theory, yeah, quite many people did it. Yes, yes. And how about the neutron star? Hmm? How yeah. about the, uh, because I did not update, so how, how's the neutron star like for binary? Are there any multi-mason for this kind of Ah, so after the coalescence, you know, after the collision. No, I, I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting question, actually. Black, because it's a black hole. If you follow hmm? this theory, mm -hmm. I feel like, if I can, if, if we can get multi-messenger from the neutral star and black hole binary, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a little space, right? Mm -hmm. Because you say black hole is zero, and if, I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. after it, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because for neutral star and black hole, it seems like the final state should be, should be black hole. So it should mm -hmm. not have multi -messenger. Yeah, so, no, basically, yeah, if it become like black hole, single object black hole after the coalescence. Mm. So basically there is a particular frequency, right? Still it carries the information of scarlet and star kind of hair, I think. I, I, but I am not quite sure. But in the case of black hole neutral savanna, if it become like black hole, <laughs> then so the hair can be lost. So right, in that case. So in that case, but uh, then it behave like a GR, right? I think. Then, yeah, but during inspired phase, at least it's different from GR. But after the coalescence, so if the observation says that it's similar to GR, then it can actually confirm this kind of theory. So yeah. You mean yeah, for, so. for in, in parallel work is something like mm -hmm. most of them working on the inspiral phase? Inspiral, I mean the. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you combine each other, it's very perfect, actually. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. It actually shows them different. Then neutrons and neutrons binary become neutrons, right? And in that case, still you have a hair after the coalescence, for example. Yeah, then by quasi normal frequency, actually you can measure, right? That if it become black hole, it shows some different signature. In this kind of theory, so there is no hair. So it's like GR kind of frequency, quasi normal frequency. So you can distinguish at least. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. So, uh, mm. uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So if you have some time, can you introduce something like uh, how's the progress in Capra? I think it's not not good. So uh, oh. actually, yeah, yeah, it's kind of disappointing. So uh, so they didn't find anything, right? Then, yeah. So yeah, I don't know how to say that. I'm not really involved in that. So. Mm. But uh, yeah, they didn't measure anything. So <laughs> unfortunately, so far. I hope they did something at least. You know, <laughs> yeah. This we only always use LIGO kind of data. Yeah, LIGO bargo data, but not really Kagra data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the point is interesting actually. Like, yeah, you can distinguish like neutral star, neutral binary. 
neutral star black binary. If you can measure after the correlation, their yeah, frequency, so yeah, you can distinguish differently. Yeah, that's also interesting. Point, yeah. so maybe nobody mentioned that point. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe there are some questions from the online audience. Can you bring it up? Oh, I have, I have to read. I can read from my phone. <laughs> so, so how, how does the computation of the Fourier transform computational wave fun under the stationary phase approximation mm -hmm. compared to other methods of the wave fun analysis? That is a great question. Compared to what? Compared to other other methods of wavefront analysis, oh, uh, typically I, I I don't know much, much literature, but uh, typically you know, people use this kind of approximation and dropping the oscillating mode. But I think that I'm, I'm quite sure that if you just do it numerically precisely, I think this approximation is very good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I think you can really drop the oscillating mode. So yeah. It's good approximation. That's the reason why people use it here. Yeah. yeah. And the next question is, what are the advantages and limits of the of, of each method? Each method. Yeah. <laughs> you can read yourself. That's a, that's an advantage and each method. In the method in this. Case. Um. Yeah. Method is uh, Ah, uh, I mean, so the approximation or stationary phase approximation or uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know the meaning of method. Which method? <laughs> Which method? <laughs> I don't understand the meaning of method. So. Yeah. Sorry. Ah, I see, I see the previous one. Okay, so, ah, right, right, right. sorry, I didn't compare, actually. I don't know there are some other kind of wave approximation. But as far as I know, so it's a good approximation. So, yeah, without using this approximation, it's di difficult to get the analytic home of Russian wave. That's the reason why people use it. Of course, you can solve it numerically. Yeah, but I'm sure people did it and then confirmed this kind of approximation, and which is accurate, I think, yeah. Right. You can drop this kind of fast oscillating mode. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, safety, uh, I think. Yeah. Okay. I think it's about time. If you have more things to discuss, you can continue after this. And we have some little things for uh, ah. I would like to invite Dan Kompi to, to pick up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, can't be. Okay. Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you. I like this. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Can I get it? Okay. <laughs> great, great, great. Great, great. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for okay. this very wonderful talk. And okay. Okay. Thank you. And much. so before um, we stop, um, I would like to ask you guys to complete the survey form, which is actually um, I will start put uh, the link already on 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 the YouTube channel. I believe you can go. Uh, so that, and then I also would like to uh, make announcement that actually this month is quite special. We're going to have another talk for Holoquium on 24th of this month. And tomorrow we're going to have all day activities. Start from the morning, we're going to have Eve congregation, right? And in the afternoon, we're going to have MOU ceremony between Eve and, uh, no, in between the Nelson University and uh, Narit. And we're going to have a public talk about well, cosmology, that kind of stuff. But sorry, those talk going to be in Thai language. Then, but but anyway, you can come and enjoy the talk. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, and stay tuned for the next talk. Bye bye.
Okay. ไม่มีเสียงอ่ะมันต้องมีเสียงหรือเปล่าไม่มีเสียงไม่มีเสียงอ่ะเครื่องนี้มันไม่ออกถ้าออกจากเครื่องนี่เปล่าไหมก็คือจะอินบอร์ดแทนเลยเพิ่งทำเองนี่ไงมันมาออกเสียงเสียงไม่เข้าเขาไม่เข้าเพราะมันเรื่องนี้ไงมันเลยไม่เข้าโอเคเข้าใจแล้วเออเอาเอาเอาเสียงออกไปเราต่างกัน